This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Thursday, March 14th, 2024 edition. I'm Justin Klein, and our objective here is the same as it always is, which is to help you become a better investor. And we do that mainly by answering your questions as well as giving you topics that are top of mind for me that are likely to impact your finances in some way, whether that's risks in the market, whether that's opportunities in the market, maybe it's uh, tax changes. Uh, you know, We try to give it all to you so that you can take it back to your situation and apply it effectively. We obviously can't make the trades for you unless you're a client of ours, but if you want to do it on your own, we're trying to give you as much tools as possible to make that happen in your own way. Now, before we dip into the topics for today, I want to remind you that we're coming up on the deadline for you to fill out your Talk Market Madness bracket. It's this Sunday is the deadline. Uh, we're going to be previewing the matchup for Tuesday. That will be on Monday's show. So that's why your deadline is is Monday is Sunday. So uh, if you want to join the fun, it is free to play. And you just have to head over to investtalk.com, download your brackets, fill them out, and complete your bracket using the link provided. And be sure to download every podcast for more updates and details as we go forward with our first ever Invest Talk Market Madness Contest. Now, with that said, let's talk about the market performance today as well as run down some show topics. But right after we answer our first caller question now. Hi, this is Justin. This is Amir from Detroit. I had a question about S 500. I have about like a 30% of my portfolio of 500. I wonder if I should keep it or I should sell it or like keep it to see that if it grows a little bit more or not. Thank you so much. Bye. Well, you're just indexing, right? You're in the most popular index that's out there. That index is leaning on the growth side of the market, just the nature of how these things are constructed. And that's going to be, you know, probably not the best place to be going forward, although it probably do fine, right? Because generally asset prices are likely headed higher. Liquidity is strong. Uh, while the market's overbought now, we probably will get some sort of refresh pull back over the next few months. Do um, you want to time that? Maybe, maybe not. Are there tax implications? I don't know if this is in a taxable account or not. That's a question. Um, but obviously, we're in the mind that in an inflationary environment, in a higher cost capital environment, the value side of the market is going to do better. And it has, really, since interest, rate have gone, interest rates have gone up. And so... Ideally, you'd be more in a value-focused index as opposed to a growth-focused index if you just want to index. Or you can do it on your own, right, buying individual names, and that takes a bit more work. So it's a, it's a fine index. It's probably going to still do okay, but it's probably not going to be the best place to put your money for the next decade. There, are probably, there will be better places where the fiscal dominance that we are in with government spending so much, with inflation, as you've seen lately, that reacceleration that is part of the environment that we're in, the macro uh, secular trend that is now taken hold. It's a it's a, an inflationary environment. Now that is typically good for stocks, but typically good for certain parts of the market: energy, materials, industrials, financial services, and real estate typically not good for tech and communication services and healthcare, utilities, consumer staples, 
Those are areas that tend to not do quite as well, either they're bond proxies in the fact that it, in, in utilities and consumer staples, or they're growthier names like in tech and communication services. And once again, those tend to underperform. And the, the S&P is weighted towards, more weighted towards, you know, tech communication services. And, 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 and you probably don't want a lot of that, um, but you have to do more work. Do you want to do the work is the question. If you don't, I think you'll do okay, but you could do better. It's all about how much work you want to put in. Now let's head over to Sid in North Carolina. He wants to talk about CRM Salesforce. Hi, Justin. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, yes, I do have this stock in my portfolio, and I think approximately one and a half months back, I asked this question, and your and Luke's recommendation was to wait until it reached 300. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have around 1% of my portfolio with around 35-40% of profit. Should I keep it uh, with me as it is, or take the profit and sell it off? Uh, what is your recommendation? Thank you so much. Well, I will say near term, there's a bearish consolidation going on from this move on March 5th. And this coincides with the growth side of the market really starting to, to fade. And CRM would be, Salesforce would be one of those names, trading at 30 plus forward looking earnings. You know, it's an expensive name with growth slowing. So this is definitely a good time to potentially trim it or eliminate it. Now it's only 1% of your portfolio. That's a very small, that's a small position. So it's not like you're overweight or anything like that. Now it's a good company. It's a fine company. It's just a bit overvalued, I think at this point. So depends how, what you had to put that money into. I think there are probably better opportunities out there, uh, but there's definitely a lot worse companies you can be invested in as well. So it's really about that broader allocation. I'd have to look at your full portfolio. How much exposure do you have to the tech, to uh, software companies like Salesforce, uh, et cetera? A lot of these names have gone on a big run. Once again, they are a bit overvalued. And so I would be in the mind to find something better, but you're going to have to do that. You have to find something better. Otherwise, you just hold it. Thanks for the call. Now we're going into a short break. Alan from Dallas, hang on, you'll be next and then we'll run it down today's plan topics and talk about today's market activity. Please remember, you can call anytime and leave your question on the Invest Talk Voice Bank. If you're listening via the live stream on AM 1220 radio in Silicon Valley or on our website, investtalk.com, you can call right now at 888-99-CHART. Invest Talk callers make each podcast unique. I was pulling about Intel, if it's worth holding on to, or should I sell it? Their questions are curious. Hello, I had saved up around $80,000, and I was wondering what I should do to make it grow. Careful. Oh, I'm just wondering, is this a value trap? Because it looks like it's gone down quite a bit. Concerned. Uh, It's taken quite the tumble today. I've been trying to get out of this position for a while. I think I waited too long. And clever. This seem to be situated in some areas of expanding population. And Justin Klein, Steve Peasley, and now Luke Guerrero are always ready with their unbiased answers. And this is, it looks like a classic example of chasing yield. Don't chase the yield. Next 12 months price to earnings is around 30. I just don't see it at this price. Don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. In today's market, more than ever, you need unbiased investing guidance because it can help you achieve financial freedom. Well, you've come to the right place, Invest Talk, And Justin Klein is here now taking your calls live. So step up with your questions, 888-99-CHART. Let's go talk to Alan in Dallas. He's looking at S-A-N, which is... No, no, it's S-U-N. Oh, S-U-N, okay, Suncor. Sun, Sunoco, excuse Sorry me. Sorry about that. No yeah. problem. Okay, Sunoco. You own it or looking to buy it? I, I do have it, and it's been fantastic. But, you know, it took a big tumble today. 
and it, it, you know, it's a small company and there's really no news. So I don't expect you to know, but I, I'd like to hear some analysis of what you think. Uh, I'm almost up at, at the long term hold. Well, I think it's pretty simple here. This is Sunoco. Uh, it is a big dividend yep. payer, 5.6%. So that is a, a factor here. Anything that pays four or five plus percent uh, that has a quality business like Sunoco does, it, it tends to be uh, a bond proxy. And if interest rates are headed higher, that's going to weigh on certain parts of the market. In addition, it is a master limited partnership, which means that they typically have, or let, let me step back, not just because it's a master limited partnership, but it's its business requires a lot of CapEx. And they have a good amount of debt in their balance sheet, about $3.5 billion in debt on a $5 billion market cap. It's it's a fine amount of debt to hold. It's not like it's stretched, but you know, if it shits go up, the cost of that debt goes up. So I think those are a couple of the factors that are it's pushing uh, Sunoco down as of late. I don't necessarily think it's a reason to to outright sell it. You know, long term, it's still in an uptrend. Uh, you know, is it going through a consolidation period? Yeah, you know, it's sold off in. January and rebounded. And now you may see another dip into maybe the mid fifties. Now it's at about $60 per share. So, you know, could you see that? Sure. Uh, but it's in a business that continues to continues to be in demand, right? It distributes motor fuels to independent dealers, distributors, and other commercial customers. So I don't see that really ending, um, it operates some convenience stores. That's a good business as well. So, you know, is are you probably headed for a near-term pullback? Sure, but are you really wanting to time that? What type of investor are you? Are you a long-term investor or are you just trying to hit that uh, long-term gain mark and and sell it? What do you, what are you what's your plan here? Uh, you know, it's been such a uh, a great I I I want to keep it it's, it's really been fantastic and it pays a great dividend. So, yeah. you know, I, I, it would have to, I don't know, become a loser before I'd get rid of it. I mean, it's in a good industry. Yeah, it's in a good industry. It's a turn equity is 30%. It's a, and that's the five-year average around 35%. So it's a, it's a quality business, quality company, good cash flows. I don't see any reason to, to dump it unless you're trying to avoid a 5% pullback, which you might see over the next, uh, you know, few weeks. So, um, don't, don't let the zigs and zags shake you out. That happens a lot, especially in the commodity space. Uh, people aren't, don't like the volatility, but you know, if, if it's a good business, then you just see through the volatility and, uh, I would continue to hold it. Hey, thanks so much. No problem. Thanks for the call. Now we have a lot of ground to cover over the next 45 minutes. Our main focus point is about the PPI data, wall Street. Ended down, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but data showed U.S. producer prices increased more than expected in February. And so, so we're going to dig into the PPI data, what that means for inflation, interest rates, the real estate sector, the utility sector. Those are big movers today. So those are our, our top of mind for us. We're also going to touch on the race for electricity and what is driving it. And there are a few big drivers, and really the country is running out of transmission capacity. And we're going to dig into that topic. Also, the U.S. warns China against dumping goods on the global market. So we're going to talk about that story. And if we have time, we're going to touch on the Red Sea and Panama Canal, what's going on over there. We also have some voice bank questions. One is in regards to BGS Foods. Sorry, B and G Foods, BGS is the symbol, and then retirement investment strategy. And of course, most importantly, it's your finance and invest investment questions that come first. So if you call, just as Alan did, just as Sid did, we're going to get to those as soon as possible. So uh, don't hesitate to give us a call at 888 chart Now, just as we head to our first major break, I want to give you some exciting news. Next week, we will begin recording Invest Talk audio podcast in video form and posting it on YouTube. So Luke and I invite you to join us as we bring the financial markets to life 
with dynamic charts and in-depth analysis. So you can head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe and check out our episode there next week. Give us a call at 888-99-CHART. Investors, the goal of achieving financial freedom requires unbiased information, strategic planning, and determination. Congratulations, you found the podcast that is dedicated to helping you succeed. Invest Talk. Let's go talk to Kamalish in San Jose, wants to talk about Microsoft. Hi, Justin. Uh, last week when I saw it was, I think, getting close to 400. And next thing I know, it's already 425. And I'm getting, I know, I have some cash that I, whether I should jump in now or is it just the timing that goes up and down? Well, a lot of what you're seeing this week is uh, there's a lot of option activity uh, within Microsoft uh, and the big tech names in general. So, uh, as you get closer to OPEX, which is tomorrow, uh, there's uh, I- increasing uh, uh, forced buyers of the stock. Um, and so that's what this uh, really move is up here. Um, you know, if, if tech continues to roll, however, I don't see how, my, how Microsoft isn't uh, caught up in that. Um, you've seen the queues. I don't know if you've watched the queues, but queues are now down on the month. Market's up. Okay. Um, and then if you zoom right. out to to like uh, other subsectors, uh, you're starting to see semiconductors uh, trend downwards over the past week. Um, so yeah, I, I, from a timing perspective, I don't think it's a it's a great time to to get in Microsoft. Uh, obviously, it should be on everyone's watch list at some point, but um, not at these not not right here. You know, I think it is a bit over overvalued. Um, not dramatically so, um, but a bit. And I would be waiting for a pullback. Um, I think you'll get better opportunities throughout this year. I see. I see. Meaning, uh, you know, maybe wait until any uh, any target number I should uh, go for, like at 400 or below 400 kind of? Yeah, I would say if you get back to 360, 365, that's an area that would be interesting to me. Thank you so much, Justin, for your time and what you do. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for the call. Now, our main focus point concerns this story. Wall Street ended down after PPI data and chip makers fall. And that was really what we discussed on Tuesday. Everyone was focusing on CPI. And it said PPI matters most because that really is a leading indicator to what CPI will do two, three months down the line because producers uh, typically pass on costs or price cuts to the consumer. And PPI came in a bit hotter than expected, really based on a surge in the cost of goods like gasoline and food. And on this news, the market had trimmed the expectations of a at rate cut in June from about 81.7% one week ago. Now it's down to 62.9. So it's basically saying, yeah, we still think there's a, a decent chance of a rate cut in, in June, but it's not a sure thing anymore. You know, when you, when I ever see 80% or more in those odds, that's kind of the market pricing in pretty much a sure thing that this is, this is the base case. Now, The base case is a little more mixed. Okay. You also had retail sales that was up 0.6%, but that did not meet expectations of 0.8%. So what you saw was core PPI, that was up 0.9%, but on a year over year, uh, that was month over month. And that was down from February, sorry, from January of 0.45%. But the year-over-year number actually accelerated from 2 to 2.04. So not dramatically, but certainly was uh, was an increase. The raw PPI, month-over-month, month, accelerated from 0.32% to 0.56. So that's really what was driving it was, remember, core is stripping out food and energy. So if you include food and energy, 
that was the driver here. And the year of your number went from 1.01% to 1.58%. So an acceleration there that uh, the market certainly did, did not like. You had the 10-year. Pull this up here. The 10-year up 10 basis points, 10 and a half basis points. The 10 years now near the highest levels since early December. And, you know, this is what I, I've said this uh, for a while now that uh, the, the bond market is kind of in a consolidation phase and a wait and see phase to see where inflation truly levels out at. And, if we have bottoms around the 3% level, well above the Fed's target of two, and if we start to trend higher in inflation, what does that mean for monetary policy? Well, it might mean truly higher for longer. It might mean not three rate cuts this year, maybe one or two, maybe zero. And that would certainly throw a wrench in the way the market is is thinking. And frankly, you're starting to see this trend and that's why you're seeing the, the, the growth side of the market really fade. Because if inflation is now headed higher, that means nominal growth in the economy is, is headed higher. There's no deflationary impulse and money is going to start to flow into the cyclical names. And that's what you're seeing right now. You saw energy breaking out. You're seeing materials breaking out. You're seeing industrials breaking out. Financial services breaking out. These are all cyclical names. They tend to be on the value side of the market as well. So that's where money is rotating right now due to the CPI numbers and uh, really an economy that remains decent. Now we're heading into a break. We're going to take your calls now at 888-99-CHART. Let's say you've been thinking about learning a new language. Okay, why? I mean, how would it come in handy? And where would you want to use it? Could it be that you have an upcoming international trip? Or maybe you want to connect with family members or friends from a different culture? I think you should know about Rosetta Stone. With millions of users, it's been the world's most trusted language learning program for 30 years. Rosetta Stone is available on your desktop or as an app with audio companion and the ability to download lessons offline. Rosetta Stone truly immerses you in the language you want to learn. It has a built-in patented speech recognition engine called True Accent. So as you practice speaking, you'll get feedback on how well you pronounce words. With Rosetta Stone, you pick up a language naturally, first with words, then phrases, then sentences. It's an intuitive process designed for long-term retention. You really learn to speak, listen, and think in your new language. Rosetta Stone is an amazing value, so your special skill set is within easy reach. You know you want to do this, so don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, Invest Talk listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. Visit rosettastone.com slash today. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off now at rosettastone.com slash today. Every investor is working to build a secure financial future. How they get there and when they get there, that depends on many variables. The more you learn about how the market works, the better your chances. So don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. On the next Invest Talk, we will look into this question. Is EV euphoria dead? Automakers, including Ford, GM, Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, are, are scaling back and delaying their EV plans. That story is tomorrow, but now let's talk about the market for today. And one of the big news related to what we're going to discuss tomorrow is Tesla. Tesla has now hit a 52-week 
low. Oh, when that 52 we go. Sorry, the lowest level since May, but getting there, right? Uh, but last May it bottomed around $151. Now we're at $162. And I think this is the year that Tesla unravels. I think you're going to see sub $50 in Tesla stock by in the next 24 months. I think that's, uh, you know, the trends in EVs are terrible. And the demand out of China is shifting dramatically. And so uh, we're going to discuss that a little bit more tomorrow. But you can see with earnings expectations for Tesla uh, continue to be downgraded for this year and next. So uh, that was uh, probably one of the biggest stories. AMD down 4%. SoFi Technologies down 4.5%. Marathon Digital down 75 And NVIDIA down three and a quarter percent. Rivian, another EV name, down 8.7, Ford down 2.3, and Palantir down 2.2. So those are the most active names in the market. And only one of the most active names was up, and that was Apple, up 1%. So uh, obviously Apple pretty heavily weighted in the indices, so that kind of helped a little bit. But broadly, small caps are down 1.5%, and that's because of higher rates. Small caps tend, on average, to have more leveraged balance sheets, more difficult time, uh, with the rising cost of capital than some of the bigger companies that have strong cash, cash positions, like Apple, for example. They probably like higher interest rates. They get to take their cash and invest it and, and earn a higher rate. And so uh, that was helping, uh, that, that, that was probably helping Apple today, where it was hurting uh, the utility side, bond proxies, real estate sectors. Um, those were, were mainly uh, down. Mid caps were also down up uh, down a little over one percent. Uh, the broad market though was down about 04 percent. As we head into opex tomorrow and the next week, we do have the uh, we do have the Fed meeting, and that will certainly be an interesting uh, interesting meeting because of the inflation data. How do they take that into their calculus of prognosticating rate cuts as we go through the year? Now let's pivot back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier on 88899 chart. Good afternoon, Steve and Justin. Steve Ogier calling in from Concord, New Hampshire. Hope all is well. Just wanted to check in on a company I have owned in the past. I was hoping I could get an evaluation from you guys on it. It's dropped pretty significantly. It's B and G Foods, ticker symbol B G S. I was thinking about maybe getting back into it. Um, really appreciate the show, and I will listen to answer on the podcast thanks all right looking at b&g foods and this is a name that we actually had owned for clients a long time ago haven't owned it in a, in a while uh, and the main reason is because of their business model and the way this company had worked it's a, it's a packaged food company so it's not an exciting name but it is a name that executes on its strategy fairly well, fairly consistently throughout the years. And what they do is they tend to go and buy up smaller packaged food brands and plug that into their distribution network. And they own a lot of brands you might have heard of, Cream of Wheat, for example, uh, let's see, uh, McDonald's, not McDonald's, McDonald's. Uh, you have Baker's, Joy, Bear Creek, uh, I know they used to own, I believe it was Jolly Green Giant. It's one of the one of the ones they bought. I think they might have sold that. But basically, they make a lot of cooking sprays and oatmeal and vegetable shortening and things like that that you 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 might see in your kitchen. Not big businesses, but when you own a lot of small businesses, you could be a big business, and their market cap is nearly a billion dollars. The problem is, is that they typically leveraged up their balance sheet in order to by these businesses. And they were throughout the years when the cost of capital is very small, very low, excuse me. It made sense because it was easy to take these cash flowing businesses, expand their distribution, increase the cash flow of all of the brands and pay down the debt and then they do it over again once their balance sheet kind of right sizes itself. The problem is is that in a higher cost of capital world now, that model is more difficult. It's kind of like a mini private equity uh, investment firm just for packaged food. And in this environment, it doesn't work as well. It, it's, it's harder to execute. 
no matter how much experience you have. The numbers just don't add up quite as easily. And so that's why this has trended lower continuously. It peaked out in early 2021 or in the around $40 per share. Now it's at 11. Now near term, I will say it's has a nice little bullish consolidation pattern. So could it had higher near term? Sure. But I wouldn't own this long term because I just don't like the business model anymore in this environment. If you look at profitability, negative 7%. Not great. Pre-pandemic, its historical return equity is in the mid to, mid-teens to low 20% range. That's a very good business. But now it just doesn't work. So outside of a short-term trade, I wouldn't buy it. Thanks for the call. Now let's talk a little bit about electricity. And this is an increasing problem throughout the country. That vast swaths of areas of the country are running short on power. Georgia, which is a state that has implemented incentives to bring data centers to their state is now seeing industrial demand surging to record highs. And their projection of new electricity use for the next decade is now 17 times what it was recently. In Arizona, the largest public utility in the state is struggling to keep up. In Virginia, they need the equivalent of several large nuclear power plants to serve all the data centers that are under construction, that are planned. And so what's happening here is because of AI, because of crypto, as well as the demand for electricity that goes into your EVs, the demand for electricity is skyrocketing. And this is becoming a big problem. Why? Because who's going to pay for that? Is it going to be the industrial companies that are setting up these facilities? Or is it going to be those that are living in that state? And this is becoming a big battle. And utilities are starting to lobby to extend the life of fossil fuel plants. And many are trying to open more because that's the most consistent base load power. And that's what you need to run these data centers and to charge electric cars. Now, in 2022, we had 2,700 data centers and it used 4% of the country's electricity. By 2026, it's expected to consume 6% of the country's electricity. And so when they're setting up these new ones, it's less about location and land costs. It's more about access to cheap electricity. That's why Georgia has been so popular because they have cheap electricity. They have a lot of nuclear plants there. And so this is one problem. But the other, it's kind of a good problem, is that there are planned 155 factories that are in progress of being built. Your traditional manufacturing factories. Not since the early 1990s has factory building accounted for, for so much of a share of the country's construction spending. And a lot of this is because the Inflation Reduction Act incentives to bring manufacturing back. So utility projections for the amount of power that will be needed over the next five years has doubled and is expected to continue to go up. So it's a mad rush for electricity for various reasons. For data centers, AI, crypto, EVs, and industrial power. Industrial plants being set up. And then who's going to pay for them? So this is a trend that you have to pay attention to. 
and why many companies that supply end products to utility companies to build out capacity are doing very, very well. So you have to pay attention to this and you need to be positioned for this in your portfolios. Now, a little over a month ago, a little over two months ago, excuse me, the SEC approved the launch of several Bitcoin ETFs. And that is what we discuss on our latest Invest Talk Classroom episode, which you can watch for free over on our YouTube channel. So you can join me and Luke as we provide a detailed analysis of what m- the future might hold in episode 17 of Bitcoin ETF Impact. Just search Invest Talk Classroom on YouTube and be sure to tell your friends. This is Invest Talk now with more than 58 million downloads. Thanks to you. Now let's squeeze in one more caller question now. Just had a question about what you might recommend from an investment strategy for somebody who's going to retire soon, looking to invest some money I just uh, was able to come by and looking to see what makes sense versus investing in a bond ladder. So I would hold the bonds and just accrue the, uh, the interest versus doing some of the dividend type stocks, maybe from the aristocrat or the king type of uh, strategies and whether or not you would pick one of these over the other or whether you might recommend doing both and then what the distribution would that be a 50 50 or what, what you might recommend again thanks for everything you guys do and i'll listen on the podcast for the answer great question and i'll i'll give you what our experience is with most of our clients uh, who are pre-retirees retirees is a little bit of both. Now, a lot depends on your risk tolerance level, depends on your goals. And that's the difficult part here. I I don't know what your, uh, what your expenses are. This is what we do for clients is build broader financial plans, understanding what your income levels are. Do you have a pension? When do you take, when, when, when should you take social security? What your expenses are? How much, what's your asset value? What kind of yield can you get from that portfolio? And Maybe bonds is enough doing a, sh- a shorter term bond ladder. That's kind of what we're, we're focused on for most of our clients now for, if, for on the fixed income side. Maybe that's enough or maybe it's not. Typically in an inflationary environment, stocks do better than bonds. And so you probably do want some level of stocks. Now, most of our clients are in what is called our balanced income strategy, which is uh, anywhere from 60, 40 stocks, bonds. Sometimes it flips. Sometimes it's 60 percent bonds and it's 40 percent stocks, et cetera. But. That is, it depends on the environment, depends on where yields are, depends on where valuations are, et cetera. But that's typically what most clients are in. So a little bit of both, the bond ladder, as well as dividend paying stocks. Um, But once again, you didn't give me enough information. Frankly, you couldn't on a call. I I need to do kind of a full plan. Um, So all those are going to be factors, your risk tolerance level, your goals, your income, your, uh, your your other income, your uh, expenses, Etc. So if you want to schedule a portfolio review, these are things kind of we dig into a little deeper, help you understand uh, a little further. And that's probably what I recommend uh, because I can't give you an, I can't give you the right answer uh, because frankly, I don't have a complete picture. Thanks for the call. Now let's grab one more quick question now. Hey guys, just want to get your take on company McKesson, ticker MCK. Thank you much. All right, looking at McKesson, this is one of those super consistent performers. It's not going to knock your socks off. It's not uh, uh, an exciting name. It is a distributor of medical supplies. That's pretty much it. My fiance, she's a doctor. She uses McKesson in her office. She orders for them all the time, you know, syringes and gauze and all the things that most doctors and hospitals use every single day. So it's a business that is consistent. It's not growing dramatically. Last quarter revenues, the, the last four quarters revenues were up uh, somewhere around 10% on average. Earnings up somewhere in the mid teens on average. Good. Not blowing your socks off, but good. Uh, and if you look at profitability, just pull this up here. It is also, it does also have consistent uh, profitability metrics. It's return of asset capital, 70%. Very good. Very quality business. I have no problem uh, with McKesson. And so I would 
I would say this is fine. It's an uptrend. Is it a bit over 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 uh, bought? Sure, but it's not in a line with uh, pro- with its uh, profits. I think it's fine. Um, enterprise value even around sixteen times for a quality business like that. I'll pay that. It's low margin, but uh, very little debt and in an uptrend. So I'm going to give McKesson a thumbs up. This is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein. We have one goal here each and every weekday, and that's help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So get your questions in now at 888 chart No two portfolios are alike, and every investor has a unique set of circumstances. So don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. Hello, InvestTalks. My question today is in relation to precious metal streaming companies like Franklin, Nevada. When I'm assessing the valuations, I notice that they sell at very high price to earnings ratio, enterprise value to EBITDA, and other value metrics. So my question is, why is that? Franklin, Nevada has some negative sentiment because of their issues in Panama, and with the drop since its high, it's become the cheapest in the past 10 years. So I see some opportunity here. My portfolio also requires some more basic material exposure. I appreciate your help as always, and I'll be listening on the podcast. Thank you. Are you looking at Franco, Nevada? This is a name we do own for clients, so we like it. And uh, and you're right. The streaming companies do tend to trade at higher multiples, and there's a very good reason for that because their cash flows are far more consistent. Their earnings are far more consistent than the miners. Why? Because what they do is they go and they co-invest in these mines with actual gold miners. Frank and Nevada, they don't operate any mines. They just own parts of those mines and they get a they get streaming uh, cash flow based on the production of those mines. So the big they, they, they this allows the large miners to reduce the risk that hey maybe they millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into building this mine, and maybe it doesn't work out quite as well as they had hoped. And they don't have to put out as much capital to do it either. But Franco Nevada and all the other streamers, they still get, no matter what comes out of those mines, they get a certain percentage of what comes out. And the consistency of that, because it doesn't matter where gold prices really are, right? They're, they don't have the operating leverage. They're just, it's pure profit from what comes out of there. And so that's why they trade at higher multiples. Now, there is risk that eventually, sometimes those plants do get shut down. That's what's happening now um, in Panama and why Franco Nevada has fallen. Most of the time, those, those, those mines are just running no matter what. Whether prices are high in gold and silver or they're low. Those companies, those miners still need to run them and try to earn some money and some cash flow uh, and pay those employees. So that's why they traded a premium. I do think Frank Nevada is a is a good opportunity right now. Thanks for the call. Now, lastly, let's touch a bit on the a news that was underreported. This actually was last month, and it was about Beijing, sorry, Washington warning Beijing not to dump their goods on the global market. Now, what's happening in China is because of bringing supply chains back, the there's overcapacity in China. There's all these plants that aren't getting a lot of new business, and some of that business is moving overseas too either other Asian countries or to their local, their local countries, right? Back to Europe, back to America, et cetera. And so the worry that the United States has is that they're going to take that, use that extra capacity, produce goods and sell them cheaply overseas, undercutting their competitors, undercutting profit margins for companies that, you know, pay taxes and create a deflationary impulse. Washington doesn't want that. They want inflation. 
As I said before, they want to inflate their way out of this debt. That's the plan here. And so a deflationary goods environment is not inflationary. So they're trying to avoid that. And this is a good example of the type of policies that they are pursuing. Why wouldn't you want your constituents, your fellow Americans, for example, to be able to access cheap quality goods? Well, it's because they're more focused on keeping inflation relatively high, not super high, but elevated. And they want to favor their U.S. counterparts, the U.S. companies. And this is another example of the trend that probably is not going anywhere. So I wanted to highlight that because policy is a big factor in the way the economy is evolving. I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. And remember, tell your friends about our Market Madness contest. You win up to a you can win a thousand dollars grand prize. It's free to enter. Just head over to investtalk.com. You have till Sunday to enter. Independent thinking, shared success. It's Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461. Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial.